Uh, I'm Noel Sharkey, I'm a Professor of Robotics and Artificial Intelligence at Sheffield and a Professor of Public Engagement there as well. So we're looking at AI and robotics, avatars as well. I'll speak a little bit about my idea of robotars. My knowledge of avatars mainly comes from working with this group. Now we're looking at really tw up to 2066 by my reckoning. If you think about how old these kids, 14 year olds are going to be, we're looking at the, their work span life, so it's up to 2066. And there's one elephant in the room, or a potential elephant in the room, I'd just like to throw out there, which is quite provocative, and I'd like to get it out of the way. And that's the idea of a sentient or super-intelligent AI, which is talked about a lot, the singularity and things. Now, my position on this is that I'm, I'm an agnostic, but I'm an agnostic on the sceptical side. Um, because I'm a scientist and I believe in empirical evidence, and I've seen no evidence of sentience or superintelligence in 30 years of working in the field. The kinds of arguments that don't cut it with me are in principle arguments like we're a biological machine, so what? Um, nor do arguments that come up usually are based on things like, well, people didn't um, think that this would work in the past, but they were wrong. Uh, but that doesn't mean that everything that everybody thinks will work in the future. By the way, I should say what I think AI is. Uh, it's the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by humans. That's the old Minsky definition. I've modified that a bit to incorporate illusion, but I won't throw it out here. So what I think, one of the great progresses in robotics at the minute, as, as you were just showing there with the, with the female robot, is in anthropomorphic use of robots. So people are very, very easily fooled. My very first robot, many years ago, was a really badly mechanically designed robot. It was so awful, it just sort of rattled around. And as it drove around, uh, the sensors weren't very good either, and it was. It, I had trained it, I, I work in machine learning, I had trained it to avoid people. So it would come up to someone, and it only had two wires there, and, it, and it trained it with screwdrivers, two wires onto two sensors, and it would come up to people, and it would rattle back and forward trying to get round them. And they would say, oh, it's trying to make up its mind which way to go. That's what people automatically think. So we're, we're coming closer and closer to the illusion of, of human or animal-like intelligence. And... You know, we'll, we'll keep getting closer. I don't know if we'll cross the uncanny valley or, or not in my lifetime, but as we get closer and closer, obviously, it might be possible. I'm not saying it will be possible, but it might be possible to really fool people into thinking that what you're talking about is actually real, and then all the philosophical arguments kick in. Is this intelligent? Is it real or not? We're going to see a lot of more domestic robots, but again, I don't know how fast that's going to be. We've got the vacuum cleaner now. We've got pool cleaners. We've got window cleaners. We've got really good machines. But I, I remember right back in the 70s, well, I, I, I've read right back to the 50s, where all domestic chores were going to be handled by robots by 1975. Okay. And one of the great breakthroughs came in the mid-80s when we decided that we're not going to go for human-level AI, we're going to just make things much simpler, not big vision systems. This was Rodney Brooks. Use lots of local sensing and stop trying to make multi-purpose robots. R robots being used for care. So this is big. There are 14 companies in Japan and Asia making robots for childcare. All this anthropomorphism again. I'm a little bit worried with that. I won't talk about it too much. Uh, they're also making robots for care of the elderly. And I'm not so concerned about this. There's a certain amount of deception here in terms of companions, which I won't go into. But generally speaking, uh, the good news is that if it keeps you out of a care home for longer, I want one. Kirsten's work here, which is seminal on therapy for autistic children, uh, so it's using, autistic children seem to really love robots. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't know the reason. Robots don't have theory of mind, which is one of the things that autistic children are not supposed to have as well. But I'll let uh, Kirsten talk about that in the discussion. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is, is this is more futuristic. It's, a, it's another way of looking at it rather than the AI route. One thing about the AI route, of course, is that um, we've also got the synthetic biology route going on at the minute, and that could be a race, and we could have a kind of mixture of organic and inorganic, like the cyborg thing. I have no way of telling there. There's so much work going on in brain stuff, so many weird things happening. Again, the American military now have remote-controlled beetles, the big beetles the size of your hand, African beetles, because they have to be that big to carry the electronics, and you can't really put a payload on them or put any kind of... Uh, computing or GPS on them yet, because it's too heavy. But nanotechnology is making everything smaller, so... And I thought, well, it's stupid. Why would the American military do this? Because how are they going to kill people? They can't put weapons on them. 
but they pointed, the CIA pointed it, I do converse with the CIA as well, and uh, nobody hears in the CIA. Or, you know, <laughs> um, but they, they say to me, well, of course, what we do is we just have a simple little charge of a, a noxious chemical that will assassinate a single person. So the beetle comes along and you think, what's that? Gone. Oh, God. I was advising the government on technology for the health service, and one of the things I had to look at them, look at for them was implants, okay. which isn't that advanced, really. A lot of experiments with, with rats, uh, you, can, you can remote control a rat, for instance, by, by making it think that its whiskers being touched on the inside by planting electrodes in there. We're starting to understand the brain, brain very well. So you touch the rat's internal whisker, and if it moves that way, you give it a huge blast of pleasure in its pleasure zone. Now, humans also have been experimented with in the past where they've put um, electrodes into the pleasure center of the brain. And I'm told by people who have worked on this that the humans nearly break their fingers off when they want to take it out again because it's so intense and powerful. It releases lots of natural cocaines and things into your brain. So at the moment, the only way you could have a robot heart is by having sort of major brain surgery, essentially. But it's possible. It would be possible in the past to make me, to have you in a boxing match so you're being thumped in the face by a virtual character, and it's really painful. But afterwards, there's no bruising, because it's all being in your brain, in your internal. So it can make you feel pain if we want. Um, so it's kind of an idea of walking into a brick wall. So we can kind of do a much better virtual reality there, because with virtual reality, you cover people with sensors. But how are you going to get the feel of sand, for instance? You know, it's very detailed. Now, there's another technique that's being developed, and I think maybe it will go the way that EEG went, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that's a kind of big device you hold above somebody's head and you direct magnetic, very strong magnetic impulses into particular brain areas. And it's been used with some success for tremors, for instance, for Parkinson's. Uh, you can't wear it yet because it's too heavy, but, but give it time and we might be able to.